today we're going to be talking about aortic valve stenosis, the pathology, etiology, as well as the pathophysiology associated with it. Now, aortic valve stenosis. You know the aortic valve is the valve that connects the left ventricle to the aorta, which then supplies to the extremities of the body. Now, the normal valve is usually around 4 centimeters long, and on the screen now where the mouse is pointing to, the normal valve usually has three leaves. Majority of the people in the world have a valve with three leaves, but it's also normal that some people have a valve with just two leaves, so it's bicusp instead of tri. Now, a stenotic aortic valve would look something like this on the screen now. Here you can see that this valve has undergone fibrotic changes as well as sclerosis, meaning hardening, due to lipid accumulation as well as oxidative free radical damage and fibrotic changes. This would then cause the aortic valve to become more permanently more hardened and less susceptible to opening opening easily. So imagine in this situation where the mouse is pointing to on the left that if you have a stenotic, fibrotic, sclerotic valve, so three words used together, and the blood left ventricle is trying to push blood, here the pressure gradient will eventually increase. And then eventually the pressure here in the left ventricle will be greatly immensely increased compared to a normal left ventricle. So therefore the left ventricle or the myocardium in this situation has to work much more harder to push the blood out into the extremities of the body. So then because of this reason there might be less perfusion, um, there, there will be associated hemodynamic changes which I will touch upon in this video. Hemodynamic changes means what type of changes does the heart itself undergo in order to uh, comp uh, compensate for these changes. Now a stenotic valve is usually around less than one centimeter so you can see the diameter here was four centimeters where here is one centimeter. Now a normal leaflet like I said before can have either three leaves or two. Now people with two leaves are more at risk because of increased pressure on the valves because of the blood flow. So each time blood flows through these valves the blood f forces these valves open so therefore the valves are under immense pressure or oxygen free radical damage as well as plaques and various different things in the blood components that accumulate in that area. Now there are various different types of mechanisms that cause aortic valve stenosis which we'll go through in this video. Now as you can see as the aortic valve becomes more sclerosis, so the whitening, deposition of hydroxyapatite, calcium, sclerotic changes, you can see the diameter is slightly decreasing and eventually as the disease progresses and finally it usually leads to very valve obstruction. Now what these changes actually cause or how does a cardiologist can diagnose these changes is by auscultation. Now you know the normal heart sounds i.e. the lub dub or the S1 S2 sound is the S1 is caused by a closure of the mitral and atrial valves whereas the S2 is caused by the aortic and the pulmonic valves. So now obviously in aortic valve stenosis we're interested in the aortic valve so the dub sound or something accompanied with that area would be more affected. So let's have a listen to what the normal heart sounds sound like. So in this in here now you can hear the lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. The first one being S1, S2, S1, S2. Now in someone with aortic valve stenosis, you would expect to hear because the pressure here is much more greater because of the the valve is not uh, easily opened there would eventually when the pressure gets so much or above a certain threshold it would eventually push or cause a click sound when it quickly opens the valve leading to a swoosh sound so listen to a swoosh so the swoosh sound that you hear on the screen now is typical for someone who's suffering from aortic valve stenosis and this is best heard in the carotid region near the neck as well as in the left base or the f in the second intercostal space. Now what are the signs and symptoms of someone presenting with aortic valve stenosis? Usually they present with breathlessness so this is ex ex uh, self-explanatory because the amount of uh, oxygenated blood from the lung comes back through the pulmonary veins into the atrium and then into the ventricle because of this reduced or non-functioning stenotic valve enough blood cannot be get around to the blood so the cardiac output is reduced they might complain of chest pain and pressure or tightness due to um, the cardiac muscle working much more harder this can be easily confused with someone suffering from some sort of angina or ischemic heart disease so 
please be aware of this. They can also cause fainting and also cause syncope. Syncope is when the amount of blood flow to the brain is diminished, so therefore you feel um, lightheaded as well as low uh, blood perfusion into the brain. You can feel palpitations or arrhythmia such as supraventricular arrhythmia and cardiac arrhythmias due, due to increased or compensatory mechanism trying to get the heart to pump faster. And you'll also see a decrease in the activity such as upon mild exertion they will feel very shortness in breath as well as reduce ability to do normal activities. The final and last one, the main one, is the heart murmur which we heard just before. Now the cardiac auscultation area is very important as a cardiologist you should know that the I'm not going to run through all these different points here because they are explained in other videos. The aortic area, so you can see, you can pause the video now and learn this diagram off by heart. In the aortic area, i.e. known as the left base, or the first in, found in the second intercostal space, so the first point found in the second intercostal base on the right side, so it's the right base, sorry, I mentioned left base, the right side of the patient, is where you can hear the aortic stenosis best and also in the carotid region. You can also hear aortic valve sclerosis as well as flow murmur. You can check for the others by pausing this video to find out where, what other regions are best used and best heard for other pathological conditions. Now, cause of aortic valve stenosis. There are three main causes. Usually stress over time. So as you become, when you're young, you have less stress in terms of not bodily stress, i.e. the force applied on your stress caused by the force applied by the blood pressure. So over time, your valve is undergoing more stress across as you get older it has gone through so many years of the same blood flow so the stress over time uh, applied on the valves is much more greater you can be suffering from chroma uh, chronic rheumatic fever which would present with usually mucoedema fibronecrosis and self-proliferation which I'll explain later in this video or it can be age-dependent calcified stenosis so let's look at some of the risk factors so someone with two valves or three valves a risk genotype, so sometimes they can be born with two valves. So someone born with two valves is more at risk of developing aortic valve stenosis. Older age, as well as the male sex, because I, I'm guessing this is the reason is because the male sex probably um, are more genetically susceptible to aortic valve stenosis. Dyslipidemia, diabetes, people condition suffering from metabolic syndrome such as hypertension, as well as smoking, renal insufficiency, and increased serum phosphate. So these are all conditions you want to take in to con uh, into consideration because these will increase the likelihood or increase 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 the risk of developing aortic valve stenosis. Now, as the disease initiates, you can see this is caused by usually shear stress, inflammatory processes. So, inflammatory process due to some sort of bacterial infection, such as endocarditis or rheumatic fever. Endocarditis can cause inflammation of the valves when something in the body undergoes inflammation there's increased blood flow and eventually some sort of fibrotic or sclerotic changes always takes place lipid infiltration due to hyperlipidemia myofibrillar uh, uh, differentiation these all then inflammation usually causes increased production of reactive oxygen species and active pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic process accumulating into calcification so pause the video if you didn't understand that so the take-home point is as you age there's more stress, more mechanical stress on your aortic valves. Likely, uh, like that, you can undergo some sort of inflammatory reaction. Your aortic valve could undergo inflammatory reaction due to some sort of bacterial infection or something, rheumatic infection in the heart. Someone with high lipidemia can have lipid infiltration as well as this all then leads to myofibrosis differentiation of the aortic valve. So as the disease progresses, you can see there's more oxidative stress, increased angiotensin 2 levels. So people with increased angiotensin 2 levels would be someone with hypertension because angiotensin 2 is what causes blood pressure to increase. Is also being said to have increased risk of aortic stenosis as well as OPG, Rankel, uh, Procalcific Stimulatory. If you know the uh, osteoblast and osteoclast activity, Rankel and OPG are stimulatory pathways involved in that, as well as winced LRP, which we're not going to go into detail in this video. Now, when the valve becomes completely obstructed, you can see hydroapatite nodules or calcified plaques around the valve, as well as cartilage and bone formation. These are all, this is because of increased connective tissue being formed, and pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic changes have taken place leading to calcification, causing the 
fibroid necrosis and mucoedema to take place leading to L2 bowel stenosis. Now although risk factors and downstream mediators appear similar to L2 valve and atherosclerosis such as older age, male sex, hypertension, smoking, hypercholesteremia, hyperlipidemia, many as 50% of the patients usually with that presents with L2 valve stenosis don't actually clinically have any atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis is a very important factor considering increases likelihood and risks of L2 valve stenosis but usually 50% of the patients that come in with L2 valve stenosis does not present with atherosclerosis. They can be fit and healthy, but maybe moderately in their mid 30s or 40s. So someone who works out, someone who regularly exercises, someone who works out or has increased cardiac output is more susceptible to L2 stenosis because of the increased shear mechanical stress. Now, rheumatic fever, like we said, was a number two and it's one of the main causes that you need to know in order for L2 valve stenosis. Rheumatic fever can be split into acute and chronic. Acute rheumatic fever is usually caused or postulated because of group A beta hemolytic streptococcal pharyngitis, so some sort of streptococcal infection. The exact cause of acute rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease is unknown, but acute rheumatic fever usually tends to occur after some sort of infection from streptococcal pharyngitis. The virulence, the reason why this affects it is because the virulence factor, i.e. the streptococcal meningitis or the bacteria, has an M protein which is stru structurally resembles human myosin. So the M protein released from the bacteria is very similar to the human myosin molecule uh, in the muscles. It is presumed that the uh, group A streptococcal pharyngitis adheres to the pharyngeal mucosa of the patient and activates antigens and superantigens which trigger an immune response. So basically acute rheumatic fever can be thought of as streptococcal infection because the bacteria has a similar M protein to myosin molecules this causes an autoimmune reaction which then attacks the L2 valves or the collagenous materials within the body. It's not just the valves that it attacks, it attacks the pericardium, endocardium various different structures but in, for this video purposes we're just talking about L2 valve. Chronic rheumatic fever on the other hand so on before we go into chronic rheumatic fever you can see here you can do a swab test to see the streptococcal infection usually affects joints, heart, skin as well as the nervous system and on the screen now you can see once the mitral valve or the L2 valve becomes affected so in this illustration is a mitral valve you can see the chordae tendinae here. You can see some fusion of the chordae tendinae and thickening of cusp and contact areas. And you can also see neovascularization, so new, new vascularization or new blood vessels being formed. So the, in terms of our classification, chronic rheumatic fever is when you have some fusion or commissural fusion, which is what, which is what they usually call it, and new blood vessels growing into the cusp area. So you can see an aortic valve that's been fused so the fusion here, usually it was meant to be three leaves. So you can here, see here, this leaf has fused with that one, so it's become two now, resulting in a bicuspid valve that is competent, still competent, but less and hardened. Now this is just a mechanism of how L2 valve stenosis usually occurs. So usually a, dis a disruption in the L2 valve or the endothelium va vascular valvular endothelial dysfunction causes inflammation leading to infiltration of um, lymphocyte as well as accumulation of apoprotein B and apoprotein E. These all then go on to cause release of chemokines such as interleukins and tumor necrosis factors. This then causes fibroblast um, activation. Fibroblast then causes myofibroblast and myofibroblast is involved in the reactive oxygen species cycle. The reactive, reactive oxygen species cycle then leads to oxidative stress. Extracellular matrix protein such as Osteoclast and osteoblasts are also activated by reactive oxygen species, leading to activation of the Rankel and BMT pathways, leading to L2 valve calcification. So, pause the video. This might be too un um, complicated for you to understand. The only thing I want you to take away from this is usually when there's an infection or an L2 valve endothelial dysfunction, there's an inflammation that occurs, then a valve remodeling takes place leading to fibrosis and mineralization which causes l valve calcification leading to sclerotic changes. Now chronic rheumatic fever, like I said, the only thing I want you to remember is commissural fusion and formation of new blood vessel. 
So now what are the outcomes or the hemodynamic changes that usually occur? Since left ventricle has to overcome a higher pressure, it un usually undergoes a concentric, concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. So there are two differences between eccentric and concentric. Concentric is when the myocardium or the muscles of the heart usually grows inwards. So you can see here, whereas in the eccentric, it usually goes outwards and there's an increase in volume overload. So there's the two difference. Pause the video to understand the difference between concentric and eccentric. So in chronic aortic valve stenosis or chronic rheumatic fever, usually concentric. The only thing I want you to take away from this video is concentric changes. Concentric left ventricular hypertrophy takes place, leading to various different conditions. So that would lead to left increased left ventricular pressure, causing left ventricular hypertrophy left ventricular and left atrial hypertrophy leading to decreased or the same cardiac output. This would then put extra pressure on the patient leading to restlessness, feeling breathlessness as well as uh, chest pain, tightness and various different problems. So that's all I want you to take away from this video. Please leave a comment, subscribe and share the video. Thank you.